Okay, thank you, Todd. And I'm really excited to be here again at the Festival of Science, participating and sharing the fun and uh, intrigue of science with all of you. In just a few minutes, everyone who's watching should be able to have a prototype similar to this if you have the supplies. And if not, I will give you the material list and you can make this in just a few minutes. Um, so just a short introduction. Uh, we will, I'm gonna share my screen here for a minute and go to this screen, share. All right, so today, once you have created your prototype and modified it, I'm gonna ask you to share it with others so we can see what you've made. And so you'll do that by uh, putting hashtag FFOS, so Flagstaff Festival of Science, FFOS Catapult, one word. Um, or you can email me your a picture of what you have and maybe some of your data. And I would love to have that and share it out with everybody on our Flagstaff Festival of Science website. So please do share that. I'm really interested to see what you guys are gonna come up with and what modifications that you have. So the fun of science, half of it is sharing it with others. So um, what we'll need today, you can see the materials list is six popsicle sticks, three rubber bands, one plastic spoon, one projectile, all of your curiosity, and probably some other stuff around the house as we modify. So what is a catapult? A catapult is just an ancient device that's used for launching objects. Uh, it's basically from the word hurl, so it's to hurl downward and to do that without explosions, uh, explosives. So we're going to use, in this case, uh, the force of materials that we're going to deform and then let them spring back and launch our catapult. The motion that is going to result from this is called projectile motion, and that is motion that is uh, ballistic motion, and it has uh, you know, a component that's gonna be along the distance, which is the horizontal component, and then a vertical component that is going to be our height. And if you were to have projectile motion with your catapult and you were able to get such a huge force on there that you launched it at a very, very fast speed, it would actually uh, launch into the atmosphere and begin to uh, orbit our planet. And that is just basically the, the limit of projectile motion. If you shot it far enough, as it would be falling, the Earth would be curving and it would just go around our planet and orbit. And that's exactly what our satellites do. Okay, but for today, we're gonna start here at the beginning. So we always have to start with something. So let me show you the working prototype. So I'm gonna stop the share on my screen and we'll go through this together really quickly. I'll show you how fast you can make one of these. So first thing you're going to need, six popsicle sticks. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And a spoon, some sort of spoon. I'm gonna start with a plastic spoon, but you can come back later and modify with whatever spoon you have. And three rubber bands. Right? And we may use more rubber bands later, but we only need three. And that is sufficient for us to have a really nice working model. So first thing we'll do, take one of your spoons, place it where the handle of the spoon is against the popsicle stick, take one of those rubber bands and just secure it around there. So wrap it around until it's fairly secure. And for me, that's going to look just like that. Now, take your second popsicle stick, put it just underneath the first one, and wrap your ends together with the rubber band. So you're going to use the rubber band to fix these ends together, the ends that are opposite to the spoon. All right, so here. Now we have half of the model already that fast, right? The remaining four popsicle sticks, take them, put them all in a pile, one on top of the other, and last rubber band right around the middle, secure it. 
If you happen to have more rubber bands, you might want to, you know, go ahead and put a second one on here. You don't need it. Um, and then kind of scoot this first one off to the side. And that will give you just a little bit more of a level uh, platform. Oops, I just broke my rubber band. So that does occur. Uh, a little bit more of a level platform. So once you have your four popsicle sticks together, you take your first two, pry them apart. So pull them apart here. And we're going to use this basically it's like a spacer, placing it just so, moving it in and creating an angle of the spoon with the flat popsicle stick. And there you are, this is your working prototype. So you have it and we can start testing this immediately. So projectile, what do you have for a projectile? Uh, I think on the list that I posted, I said uh, small marshmallows. Those are always super fun and very uh, enjoyable to eat as well. Um, I have a few different projectiles. I'm gonna use the bright one here just because it shows on camera the best, but um, it's not gonna go as far because it's a pretty big ball. And we're gonna just test it out. So you can do this at the same time or you can watch me, but basically you are going to take your projectile and you're going to see how it works. And so we'll measure that. So we have to figure out, well, what are the ways that you would measure a projectile? And so some of the easiest ways is the maximum height for the projectile and the maximum distance for the projectile. So we're gonna see how high it goes and how far it goes. And um, I have, a, my partner here is helping me today, Casey, and he is going to be looking to see how high the projectile goes so I can record the value. I've already uh, scored this piece of paper. So I have, uh, in terms of centimeters, how high, and then along the base, I have the distance. If you don't have a huge ruler or this, that's okay. You just want to mark it, kind of keep an idea of where it is. And then you can see relatively if you increase or decrease your, your distances. So I'm starting here and I'm going to pull back on the spoon itself. I'm holding the distal end or I'm holding the end that's far away from the spoon flat. I'm making sure that I put it right in line with the start of um, my trajectory path here, which is the edge of this paper. And I'm gonna pull back and release. All right, how far did that go? Okay, so over here, according to my partner, it was about five, which corresponds to 50 centimeters. So I'm gonna record that 50 centimeters high. So 50 centimeters high. And what about the distance? Did you happen to see the distance? No. Okay, we're gonna go again for the distance. All right, so this time, my partner is going to measure how far the distance is. So we're going to pull it back. One, two, three, release, and distance. Okay, so the distance here looks like about 27 centimeters. So 27 centimeters. Okay. So the distance, another word for distance is range. So I recorded my results. It's always important to record your results so that you can see if you're getting a further distance, a, a greater height, and compare it. So I have a table over here, and you can just write this down on a piece of paper and get your uh, record for your first prototype. So I have 50 as my height and my range of 27. Okay, so now we have our working prototype. What next? Okay. All right, so what next? All right, so we are going to think about 
the physics behind this catapult now because this is our prototype. This is what we're going to start with. It's our working model. And then we're going to see if we can change it. And as we change different aspects of it, how that is going to change the height and the distance that we can um, achieve. So first a question for physics is we're thinking about what is the energy here? Where is that energy coming from? So the energy to launch that projectile, right? Um, where did it come from? So I'm asking you to think about that. I'll give you a second. Where the heck did that energy come from? Huh. Okay. So for me, my thought is that it came from the lunch that I ate today. So I had a pretty big lunch and you may think, well, that's not where that energy came from. But I did eat it and it had lots of sugar in it, which was really quickly absorbed by my body and took and put that energy into my muscles. And so the energy that was the chemical energy in the food that I ate for lunch, the sugar, was then stored in my muscles and that was stored for a short period of time. And then here's the energy. I'm contracting my muscles and I am placing the projectile here. Now, pressing down on the catapult, energy is transferred from my muscles into the spoon, right? So here, if you look at this, I'm gonna move it up here. In this case, we're really deforming the spoon. See how that's changing shape? And it wants to go back to its original shape. This is an elastic material. And so as we stretch it, there becomes more stress and tension in there. And then if I release my hand, oh, then the material uh, wants to be, go back to its original state. And that energy was then transferred from the potential energy stored in that elastic deformation into the kinetic energy of that moving projectile. Okay, so why do we care about this? Let me get my projectile. So we care because energy is going to be uh, a factor, right? If we have more energy, potentially we can have a higher, um, higher height for our projectile and a longer distance. Now, this has a certain amount of elastic material, right, in here. And you may have the same type of plastic spoon, or you may have one that's more rigid or less rigid. And so what I want to do is say, okay, what's going to happen if we change out our spoon type? So instead of this, we basically make the same type of model, right? So very quickly, we can make a duplicate, except that for our duplicate, we're going to use a metal spoon, right? And Metal is not as flexible. If you don't have metal, you can try a wooden spoon. How is that going to flex compared to the plastic? Okay, I'm going to try this metal spoon right here. Okay. And it's definitely, you can deform it. So if you're really strong, you could bend this, but it's not as easy to bend as the plastic, right? So as I build this, and you can build your own as well, Again, we are going to take the spoon, adhere the spoon uh, with the rubber band to the popsicle stick, the first one, and then we are going to take that, get a second popsicle stick, and at the end of that popsicle stick, we are going to mm. okay, at the end of that popsicle stick, we're going to have a rubber band. And there we go. So we've modified the prototype at this point, right? Uh, we've changed one thing. And it's really important in science, when you change an experiment, you want to change just one thing at a time. Why do you think that would be? Why don't we want to change the spoon and the projectile and the angle 
and the type of rubber band, and let's add in um, some other materials. Why don't we want to do all that at the same time? Okay, so maybe you have the answer. What I was thinking is that you want to have one variable because if you just change one thing, then you can be pretty confident that that one thing has resulted in the change that you observed, right? But if you change 10 things, then you don't know which of those things is the most, um, has the biggest effect on your outcome. And maybe it's a mix of those and maybe they're interacting. So it's really important just to try one thing at a time, change one variable, your experimental variable at a time. And in this case, we're changing from the material in this spoon, the plastic spoon, to the material in this metal. So the material itself, that elasticity is what we're changing. Now, if you wanna be a stickler, you could also say, well, the spoon is actually a slightly different shape, and that's definitely true, and a slightly different density, and yes, you are correct, right? But we wanna to try to reduce the amount of change possible. So we've got this, make your second prototype, all right, now, so these look pretty similar, right? Same angle, overall same design, except that we have a metal spoon. Now, before I test it, what I wanna do is to make a prediction. And a prediction is a, um, a statement. So I want to say, I think that changing to the metal spoon will, uh, and then I'm going to say if I think it's going to increase the distance that the projectile goes, if I think it's going to decrease the distance, or if I think it's going to have no effect. Chances are it's going to have some effect. So what do you think is going to happen? Because this is now rigid, do you think that that's going to go further or that it's going to shorten the distance? Right. So that's one hypothesis. And then you can also think about the height. Is it going to change the height? Is the height going to go uh, be increased or decreased because of this metal spoon. Okay, so think about that in your head, right? What do you expect to see? And it's really important to remember that it's not about being right, right? So we're not worried about uh, proving myself correct and I'm so smart because if we knew it already, we would not need to do the experiment. We're doing the experiment to learn and only by learning and especially through making what you would call mistakes, that's how we actually learn more about the world. Okay, so I've got my two prototypes. Let's go test out the second one. Okay, so moving forward. Thank you guys for being with me here in my home. It's nice to have you here, welcome. Okay, so here's this. I'm going back to my original space over here, same starting point, same original positioning of the catapult, holding on to the far end, placing the ball, pulling back with just one finger with the same amount of force, and then I'm going to release. All right, how high was that? Okay. Looks like we went up that time, we went all the way up to 70 centimeters. So it increased the height. It actually increased the height 70 centimeters. And this is for my metal spoon. So it increased the height. And what about the distance? Did you see the distance? No. Okay, we're going to try again for the distance. All right, now, here we go. Pulling back, holding down the front. One, two, three. All right, what was that distance? Okay, it looks like it was about 14. Oh, wait. Oh, this turned. So it looks like it was about mm, 10, 20, 16 centimeters. 16 centimeters. So what do I have over here? I had 27. So actually the range or the distance got shorter and the height increased, right? So we got a little higher, um, but we didn't go as far. So interesting. So we're learning, right? That 
maybe the metal and the plastic, one's not inherently uh, completely better than the other. It's just one is better for a certain situation, at least one is going higher and one is going farther in the orientation that we have our current prototype. So now let's go back and I wanna talk a little bit more about the actual science, okay? Or at least we've been doing this science, right? This has been the fun hands-on part. And then I wanna show you how that relates to um, a few diagrams and how it relates in, to physics. So I'm going back, I'm gonna share my screen here again. And there we go. So you should see the screen with the catapult over here and I'm gonna move through these slides. Okay, so the motion that is created by the catapult is called projectile motion. And you can see here, so we're starting over at this origin and you have an initial velocity which is listed as V naught or V sub zero. And that's going to be what we start with and then you could even think about this velocity as having an x component along the you know the the horizontal plane just uh, parallel with the floor and a component that is perpendicular up and down from the floor a y component and as you go through the arc the projectile is going to have a different velocity the velocity is actually going to decrease at the top where it's going to stop going up and at that point the upward velocity is going to be zero and then it'll start going down and you can see that the downward velocity is going to start increasing here now the velocity forward so velocity is measured in like distance over time so like meters per second or inches per second and so um, the velocity here in this diagram, it looks like it's not really changing that much, right? So in this model, the velocity, the up and down velocity is changing, but the, the distance, the x velocity um, is not, okay? All right, so just wanted to point that out, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's what we measured, the height, so the maximum height, and this shape here, does anyone know what this shape is called? Kind of like the shape of an umbrella and this is the characteristic shape of all projectile motion ideal projectile motion it's called a parabola okay it's called a parabola and but even if you don't know that name that's okay but it has this kind of characteristic umbrella shape right and then we measured the distance all right so we had our prototype which was our working model we're looking at the physics we talked about the energy, so the energy coming from sugar into elastic energy and muscle contraction and the energy of motion. Now the energy of motion is kinetic energy. The energy that's stored is potential energy. And this diagram here, so this is from a college textbook and it is showing, so it's, I just wanna mention that anyone who's interested has access to this textbook. It's absolutely free. It's online. It's uh, open source, which means it's made available through grants and, and the, the volunteer work of many um, educators to create a resource available for anyone who wants to learn physics. And it's a college level textbook. It's called OpenStax. And there's a link um, here, but Obviously you can't click on that because you're just watching the video, but you can put in open stacks and then you can put in physics and you have physics textbooks. I teach out of a biology textbook at the community college. So we use biology textbooks. There's anatomy and physiology. There's so many resources today that are free. So I just want to encourage you to, to use those if you're interested. Don't let the fact that you don't have a textbook stop you. And sometimes it's nice to be, to use one resource because sometimes there's information overload. So in the textbook, college, um, this is college physics. This is a diagram that looks at how different initial velocities are going to change the overall distance 
of the projectile or the range. And you can see that this red one here is 30 meters a second. It's not going to go as far as the initial velocity of 40 meters a second, which is intermediate. And then the final distance, the furthest, is going to be the highest velocity. So as you would expect, right, if you start off going faster, it's going to go further. So that's basically what this shows. Increase your initial velocity and increase your range. So if you can get that projectile to leave that spoon at a faster velocity, then you are going to go further. So that's one thing to consider when you're looking at modifying your design. How am I going to get that to be a faster release? All right. Another thing that we can look at to modify is the angle. So the angle of the projectile, and I'll, I will come back in just a minute and I'll show this example on the actual prototype. But if you have a very, very high angle, so shown here 75 degrees, it's actually not going to go as far, right? As if you have, um, say, an intermediate angle like 45 degrees. And it turns out 45 degrees, which is halfway, if you have like a corner, which is 90 degrees, halfway between the angle that's halfway between those two perpendicular um, uh, lines is 45 degrees. So halfway there, that's the furthest, theoretically, that you can get. If you have 45 degree release, you're going to get the furthest distance. And so that's helpful when you're designing a catapult, right? Oh, I think 45 degrees is where I want to be, at least ideally, in an ideal world without things like air resistance and drag and things like that. Okay, so, and then once you um, decrease your angle to say 15 degrees or you get much smaller, you're actually going to shorten again. So there's two angles that are going to go the same distance. So for these, right, this green one here, that looks more like what we saw for the uh, metal spoon compared to maybe this one over here, this purple one for the plastic spoon. So it really kind of plays out or looks like um, those differences. So I wonder if we went back um, and looked, right, if we would have a different angle. So. Let's look. I'm going to close out this PowerPoint here. So let me stop sharing that screen. Okay. All right. Okay. So how could that be? Right? So here's this one. Here's my other prototype. And we said, oh, the angles are the same. That's why we made it. The angles are the same. Right? So let's take a closer look. All right, let's take a closer look. So at these, you're right, the angles are the same because the spacer is the same, same platform. But maybe the release of, so when the projectile actually is released from the spoon, that angle might actually be different than the angle that we're looking at here. And I think that if we were to look at that in slow motion, we would see that there's actually this one, the projectile would be released at a, uh, whoops, an angle that is greater than this one here. I don't know though, we'd actually have to, to measure it. So, okay, all right. So that's one possible explanation. I'm going to go back here. Okay. So we increase the angle, we increase the height, right? Now let's think about what would be the difference if we use different projectiles? What are the properties of a projectile that are going to make it go further or higher? So if I have this projectile or I have this projectile, which do you think, this is a ping pong ball, right? Which do you think is going to go further? Okay. So there's a couple differences between these. Which one is heavier? Okay. I know you can't feel them, 
and you don't actually know, but this one's made out of wood. So this one is actually quite a bit heavier than this one. So the mass is greater in this one. And this, the volume, so the volume of the ball, this one, this ping pong ball is actually bigger, right, than this one. So there's more surface area on this one compared to this one. So I'd like you to make a prediction to think about which one of these is going to go further. Okay, the green ball, the wooden green ball, or the white ping pong ball. So that's making a predictive statement. If you do that, you have made a, hypo a hypothesis, okay? A hypothesis. And then we get to test it, right? So we get to test it. I have no idea how long I've been talking because I didn't set my alarm. So, all right, so we're gonna get to test this. And I'm gonna go back to my original um, prototype here. And I'm going to test it with the green and then with the white ball. All right, so first one, all right. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, okay, misfire. All right, misfire, sorry. Let me go back, try it again. All right. Oops. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Uh-oh. That didn't go very far. So on that one, I only got, well, I only got nine centimeters. Hmm. Okay, I picked the wrong prototype. I have the wrong one here. This is actually the one I need. I picked up the wrong one. So we're gonna use this one. Here's the prototype. I know it looks the same. I got it mixed up. Try this one. And one more time. Okay. Green ball. All right, let's measure the height. One, two, three. Oh, not getting that to work. One, two. Hmm. Okay, so that was 19 centimeters. So that wasn't very far. That's the distance. And how high was it? Did we measure the height? We didn't measure the height. Okay, so the height, let's measure the height. One, two, three. <sighs> wow. Hmm. I don't know what's happening. One, two, three. <sighs> All right. So the height was 82 centimeters, 82 centimeters. All right, 82 centimeters. Here we go. So this is, again, we're using the prototype and we are using the green ball and now, I'm going to see how it works with the ping pong ball. So, get my prototype. And one, two, three. Whoa. Okay, so that was a hundred, which is one meter. So a hundred centimeters is one meter. 100 centimeters. Okay, and this was ping pong. So this was with the ping pong. All right, so that went pretty darn high. Let's try the distance. One, two, three. Huh. One more time. 
One, two, three. Okay, how far did that go? Oops. All right, so that went, it went 117 centimeters, 117 centimeters. Okay. Wow, so the ping pong ball went further. Now let's think about our results. Let's think about our results. So the ping pong ball is, was lighter, okay? And the ping pong ball was more surface area. So if you were to look up online and you looked at projectiles, um, you would find that in general, if it's heavier, if it is more dense, um, that something as you increase the mass, right, it's not going to go as far. So if you increase the mass, um, it's not going to have as much of a distance. So we had the heavy green ball and it didn't go as far, right? So that is consistent with what you might think. If you have um, a ping pong ball and a bowling ball and you throw them both, right? Um, the ping pong ball will go further in part because it is uh, lighter, right? In the same force. But something else is at work, right? And that is, has to do with the surface area or the shape of the object. And that's called drag or air resistance. And so in general, as you get something really, really big, right? It's going to have more air resistance. So even though it doesn't look like there's anything in this room, there's all kinds of particles that are bouncing into each other. And as a ball moves through, if it's bigger, it's going to have to push more particles out of the way compared to a small ball. So for the ping pong ball, that was not the overriding effect. That means that even though it was bigger, the drag was not enough to make it go, um, to really reduce that distance compared to the green ball. So we were able to test it and to see that the ping pong ball in this case was ideal. So, so far the ping pong ball has gone the furthest. All right, so let's go back. I just wanna go back one more time to our PowerPoint here. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. I don't wanna to do too many PowerPoints. Um, but I do want to show a few figures. So this figure here is, it shows projectile motion uh, with different velocities. So you can see as the velocity increases, so 10 is the highest, and that corresponds to this blue line, which goes the farthest, right? And then as you have lower and lower velocity, then it doesn't go as far. Now what you might notice and what I want to draw your attention to is that in this shape over here, the far side, it's um, going down pretty quickly. So this is sort of a long, um, slower slope and then this is a pretty steep slope. And that's due to air resistance or drag. So if you increase the speed of something, you also increase the effect of that drag. So as you um, change your projectiles, one thing to consider is how big it's going to get, right? Uh, as, as it gets bigger, your projectile, how much uh, drag your projectile is going to see. Okay. All right. So the forces that are acting on our projectile, what's the force that's pressing down? Why doesn't the projectile just continue to go up and up and up and up? What is that force that's bringing it down to earth? It's the same thing that keeps your feet on the ground, right? And my feet on the ground. So that force is gonna be gravity and the force that's pushing it backwards here, so it doesn't just keep going forever, is going to be the force of drag, right? So gravity is going down, drag is pushing it back, and together those factors are going to um, result in a projectile that doesn't just shoot off 
into the distance forever, um, but that eventually falls to the ground. Okay, so another really fun resource here I want to show you is um, this. It's an interactive web resource. And so if you, again, just go and type in um, college physics open stacks. This is in chapter 3.4 on projectile motion. And it's actually an interactive component that allows you to change things like the height and um, the velocity of the initial projectile. So I'm just scrolling down here in the book. And here we go. I'm going to click on intro. And you can see that now we have this ability to, I can click here and change the angle of the cannon. So this is my projectile motion. So this would be like your catapult. And I can see what would happen if I made it at say 45 degrees and I started with an initial speed of 10 meters a second. Then I hit launch, launch. Okay. Oh, I hit the bullseye. Wow, I hit the bullseye at 15 meters. So that was pretty darn good. And the game is, is if how would I change my um, parameters here, my angle um, and my initial velocity to try to hit the bullseye? So in this case, would I move at the angle up or down? And would I move, or would you move the speed, the initial speed uh, up or down? So I'm gonna try just, I'm gonna reduce the speed here a little bit. I'm gonna try again, launching. Oh, shoot, too short, right? So how about nine meters a second? We try. Oh, okay. So still not dead center. So try your hand at that. It's a really great ability. This is like a simulation. So it's a computer simulation that allows you to test things um, in an ideal world, right? You can test it without forces like drag and see what the effects are. Okay. Oh, and then actually you can go over and click over here. If you want to see the effect of drag, there's air resistance. And so I clicked on the little button that said air resistance. Now I'm going to hit shoot and yeah, it didn't go as far. It didn't go as far because of that air resistance. So you can play around with these things and actually look at um, some more advanced ideas like vectors, which show um, the component of velocity and other um, uh, physical parameters in terms of their direction. Okay, so that's for you to play with. Please um, that's called uh, PHET is actually the company that makes it or the organization. They're based out of Colorado, an educational organization. And you can find that in projectile motion. All right. So about ready to wrap it up here. Um, so I showed you that. And I just wanted to show you some um, diagrams that I made of the catapult to kind of show the deformation. So here in this one, you can see the bending of the spoon being pulled back. Um, and so it's the hand, it's your chemical energy that's pushing down. And then once there's also a force that wants to push against that, and it's wanting to return to that original shape in the spoon. And so when that happens, then in this diagram, it's showing that the energy that was stored, that potential energy um, in the spoon, in the elastic is now transferred to the velocity in the particle or the projectile. And then you can see there's the projectile motion. Okay. And then you can think about uh, what would happen if you change the angle of your spoon. So that's something that you can do. You can move your, uh, you can move your, four popsicle sticks closer to the base of the spoon and get a higher angle, or you can move it further away and look at the effect that that has. And the interesting thing is about um, testing real world prototypes is that they don't always align with what you would see in a textbook, ideally. 
right? There's a lot of different variables. And so that's why it's always important to actually physically test something and see if it aligns with what you predict, right? Um, another thing to consider when you are testing your uh, catapults is the accuracy and the precision of your projectile motion. So are all of your launches hitting about the same place? So are they very accurate and are they all clustered together? Are they very precise or are they all over the place? And uh, I had a little experience earlier where, you know, it on my second trial, it was not the same as the first. So that would be um, not very precise. So the precision of that catapult was a little bit lacking. So that's something to also consider. And you can test it by, you know, do, having your catapult and let me, uh, just close out of this now. So I'm done with the PowerPoint. I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay. All right. So what you can do, you can set up your catapult. You can set up your a container. So this is my target, right? You can even have multiple targets. So you could have, here's your center bullseye. And then here is the outer bullseye. And you can try to get your catapult into your target. Oops, so that's not working. This is definitely a different type of projectile too. Okay, so you could test it wait, and try not to break it like I did and see if you can get this into here, right? And you can try different projectiles. And each time you do this, each time you try something new, just make a prediction, make a hypothesis, and then test it and see if you are uh, correct or not. Just It's just a fun game to play and to think about why might that have been different than what I predicted, right? So what are the different effects that you can come up with? So I encourage you to use other materials around the house. So I was playing around. I didn't have, you know, if I didn't have uh, popsicle sticks, you could make the projectile out of these highlighters here. So I had a plastic spoon and some highlighters and I was able to make a projectile that actually went really far <laughs> with the highlighters. So they're serving the same purpose, right? They're stabilizing it. And in this case, I didn't even have the popsicle stick along the length of the spoon. And actually getting pretty good results, pretty high results there. Um, here's an example that I had from a participant in a past workshop. They made an extremely stable base. They had lots of extra popsicle sticks and rubber bands. So you can try something like that and see how that would work, right? The variability there. Ooh, oh man. So that actually went pretty far. Um, so changing the angle there, raising it up and that's a different idea for you. Um, if you don't even have that, this was something else that I came up with, with if you happen to have a, a roll of toilet paper, right? You, and some, maybe some uh, rubber band here, then you put the rubber band on there and you think, okay, how is this gonna change, right? So then, whoa, and that went pretty far too, right? So every time you come up with a new mechanism to launch, think about, oh, what do you think is going to happen? And then think about what's another way, how could I modify this? What would happen if I just move the spoon out like this? So um, now let's try that, right? So that's a much longer, um, basically lever arm there. Woo! And I'm not going to tell you what happened, but you can try to make your own, right? And I'd love to see anything that you come up with, right? It's just fun to try to make new things. This was something else that I came up with this week, a two liter bottle, right? This is a kitchen spatula. And then, uh, you know, make sure your parents allow you to get any of these materials out of the kitchen, right? And then in this case, slightly different model, slightly different thing at work here. Um, as I press down here, that force is going to be transferred here. So there's not a lot of bending here but it's more of, of just a transfer with a, a lever. But interesting, still projectile motion, what's gonna happen? So, whew, okay. All right, so please enjoy yourself. The, the point of 
science and at least in this stage is really to have fun to have that curiosity and the best scientists that i've met are have the most curiosity so they're just interested in why something didn't work you know that's so curious i'd like to figure out why that didn't meet my expectations as opposed to saying oh i'm not good at this it's broken right it's like no there's an opportunity for you to learn there and you know we're all stuck at home during this time we're not doing the same things that we would do normally so uh, it's an opportunity to look around your house you don't have to have sophisticated equipment to do science you just need to have some curiosity questions in your mind and then the willingness to you know make a mistake what is called a mistake anyway it's just about what you're learning so i really encourage you to enjoy the rest of the festival of science it's a couple more days um, there are events on saturday and sunday uh, and it, you know ends off with a really interesting talk by a local geologist who's going to teach us all about a new hot spot under Yellowstone. Um, so thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have a great experience with the catapult that you build. And I hope that you share it with me. Um, if you do have images or you do find that you have data that you'd like to share, I'd love to see it. Hashtag FFOS catapult or you can email at dofunscience at gmail.com. All right, thank you so much again. And I am going to uh, turn it back over to Todd and encourage you to look through the other uh, items. If you missed anything, and one more thing, if you missed anything earlier this week, they are recorded, you can go back and watch them. So please take advantage of that. All right, have a great, rest of your day and a great science adventure.